You guys set? All set. All right. I think we're ready to reconvene. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm Director Driscoll. You want to introduce yourself and your guests? I will. Um, so today we have the team from Jack Rabbit uh, here again with uh, an addition, which is Creative Director Dave Bellier. He's come along as well to discuss some additional concepts uh, with us. And um, as you've uh, already met, Kara Ogar and Lynn Spooner, who've joined us previously. Um, as you know, um, prior to, I wasn't here last week, but prior to that, um, Jack Rabbit has been providing us with numerous different types of concepts to decide upon a logo uh, from which everything else will, um, will, all the additional collateral will be created from that, including the uh, very important website. Um, which we continue to aggressively work on um, despite the fact that we're still trying to make a determination on the logo. We've really gotten to a point now um, you know, that I feel like I would like to do one final um, round of concepts, um, but we've gotten to a point where I would say we don't have any more than a week to make a decision uh, so that we stay on track. Um, with the development of the website that we really need to have up by the end of the year, particularly as we go into the policy discussion um, phase of our process. Uh, it would be so nice to have the blog up and running, which will be a um, really uh, center part of our website and um, I think will be critical to the policy making process, uh, as well as um, phase two regulations. So we really want to move that along. Um, Dave is here today. As you know, we, we have all seemed to settle on the SEAL concept, mass gaming, the five stars, also the complete um, Massachusetts Gaming Commission name, and also to have the ability to highlight the various divisions, whether that be Division of Racing, um, IEB, licensing, et cetera. Um, and, um, but uh, as you know, we were trying to go for a bit of an abstract concept in that center area that would represent fear, transparent, participatory. Um, I have felt that in, in our process, everyone's been um, a little too far apart on their personal opinions on that for me to have uh, felt comfortable to move forward. Um, so, uh, and I'll let Dave speak to this, but one of the things that Jack Rabbit has said, and I, I think that I agree with them, is although we were attempting to go abstract there, um, that may not work. Um, because I think that ultimately everybody sort of wants to be able to quickly identify what in fact that, sign, that symbol is. So, Dave is going to just lead a, con a brief conversation with all of you to help them with their creative process a little bit more than what we've already had and get a little bit deeper into it, then come back, present us with some final additional concepts, and we will make a decision by next week so that we can quickly move everything else along. So I'll turn it over to Dave. And uh, we felt badly having Elaine somewhat uh, put in the middle to try to um, interpret your thoughts on the logo. So we, I felt it was important that we brought our team here to hear firsthand. We so far, as Elaine mentioned, we have uh, the seal somewhat locked down, the typography, the naming, and the, the overall construction of the, of the identity. It's that icon at the top that we, we struggle with. I was just anxious to hear through the designs. I'm, I'll just go through them. Uh, uh, design one, design two, uh, again, with the same symbology at the top, or a similar symbology representing the three sort of core messages. Number three and number four. So I was anxious to hear if you, it, it, with projects like this, especially with a, a large group making a decision on it, getting everyone a unanimous decision can be difficult. So I was anxious to get some feedback from you all on if there was one that you were leaning towards, is there anything salvageable about what we have, or do we look to totally eliminate that abstract icon <coughs> and look down another path? Could I, I'd love to see the difference between one and four. They look close to me. Sure. Um, so that's number four. Yeah, yeah, yeah the last one. The last 
Okay, that one. Oh, at the end. Oh, let me put them all together at the end. Um, and the other thing I too, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do just want to say one thing, which is that although in the beginning we were suggesting that um, uh, like an actual um, something that represents gaming, um, we were sort of artistically moving away from that, but I'd like to revisit that as a possibility um, that we think, and again, to remove the abstract of it, it's subtle, it's a small portion of it, um, but the fact of the matter is we're in the gaming business, that's, you know, what we do as regulators, so I don't know that we should be opposed to an actual image of something that's gaming related. Example? Well, well what about an abstract uh, uh, abstraction, but recognizably abstract of a casino? Right. For dice. Or, uh, right, exactly. Or and the one thing I think we struggled with that is twofold. One is the, the nature of the size of the area, especially when reduced to a business card. And the other thing was when it comes to racing and, and the other divisions, is that one symbol is uh, broad reaching enough? So, and then all of a sudden we enter into let's pick three items from three different of the components of gaming and try to mix those up and we end up with a mural or a collage that will never be mm -hmm. able to be re noticeable or reproducible. I don't see it at all to try to do something gaming. I think it muddies the, the symbol. We've come this far with, a, with, a, um, with some kind of a logo that is, uh, Elaine, how did you describe it as a, um, you had a, a word. Seal. A seal, yeah, that's very close to a seal. So I don't, I can't personally visualize a casino on there or anything else having to do with gaming. And I, I don't know that that's a necessary piece to what we're doing. I, um, I, I think I may have told uh, Elaine, um, you know, my, my, my preference in this, but I'll, I'll just mention uh, um, I was leaning towards one and four. Yeah. Um, almost by process of elimination, um, um, going by on, on the second one, it just seemed to me a little um, sort of institutional, educational rather, like a higher institution uh, type sort of, uh, uh, just my impression. Uh, whereas also the third one, uh, until it was explained to me that it was the three tenets of our mission statement, did I sort of recognize that that would, be, that would be. But I know that's that's the difficulty with abstract um, uh, symbols. I agree with you. I like one and four also. And, and I think maybe four is a little less busy. Um, so I, I'm going to just yeah. make a decision and go with four personally. I had gone with four also, but I was sort of damping with faint praise, which is, I think, what you picked up. Uh, that abstraction just doesn't move me at all. It's kind of like wasted space. It doesn't seem to me that it does anything. There's no way on earth anybody's ever going to associate it with participatory, transparent, and fair. You know, I just right. don't have a chance. But of the choice, I didn't, I didn't remember seeing number two. Number two, that kind of looks like an M to me. So mm. it sort of looks like Massachusetts, but at least it gives it mm -hmm. some relationship to you know what we are, as opposed to just something completely abstract. Um, if I, if I had to pick again from these, I think I would go with the uh, with four. But it, 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 I would say again that it just seems like kind of a waste of space. You know, there ought to be something meaningful, whether it uh, that, that could be done with the space. But short of an alternative, I'd go with four. If you were to have a choice between uh, no icon within the seal if we were to actually remove the icon, because I think from our side, we're in agreement that no casino-esque type of symbology will work. It's just, it's, uh, and if the abstracts are not causing sort of the reaction, the, the more positive reaction we're looking for, could you visualize it without an icon and more of a, a traditional seal without, still maintaining the five stars? Well, you could put the five stars above it too. You Correct. Know, so yeah. mm -hmm. then it would look balanced. I yeah. think just if you just left a hole. It would look well, we would re readjust the yeah, the, yeah. the mass gaming would be stacked as or, we call it. Or yeah. Hmm. What's the number one? It looks like 
strains of grain or strains of wheat, wheat coming off of that? Yeah, you know, sort of, uh, uh, when well, we were looking for some of the sort of authoritative or professional dignified type of state symbol mm -hmm. symbols. It's the that, wheat that the horses eat. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's the thing that's the laurel wreath, right? Yeah. 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 That the, uh, it's the rules. It's iconic to a penny or an older penny or something. <clears throat> well, I'll just uh, put my support behind uh, an icon, an abstract, uh, not, not removing it. I think it tells people whatever it tells them, uh, but it's something that people recognize so for whatever it's worth. And to your point, I think we're, we'll have a lot of great opportunities to weave and tell that story on the website and other materials that we do to, to talk about what the symbol means to us and, and to bring it out in other ways. For the logo to do that, to have the legs to tell that story in and of itself, yes, I agree 100%. It's a, no one's going to pick that up right away. But I think it, it gives us a great opportunity down the road and through other marketing communications vehicles to tell the story. Would, would you have room on number four to add the... The laurels, the, 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 the laurel. flourishes. It's going to get a, a touch busy, but we can we can explore it. I mean, I when we started this, I kind of liked number one, but then I saw number five again, and it gave me an impression of a bat. And then I looked at number <laughs> one again; that looked like a bat. So I like the balance that number four has. Because I, 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 I five looked like a bat. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, I thought five looked like a bat, and then. <laughs> like one looks a little bit like, like a bat. Kind of looks like a bat too. Or an it? owl. Yeah, but it's, it's missing that dip in the ears. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I, I do, I, I do agree. I like having some type of symbol that stresses the points of our mission. But if you can squeeze them in, I'd say squeeze them in. But if okay. not, I like number four. Okay. So number four has some consensus among the team mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it has potential with some modifications. I wonder if it's a if it's something that maybe we we go beyond just the the seal and show the logo in another use, yeah. where we bring that icon to life, where maybe you'll you'll be able to it'll begin to t tell its own story. Sure, I mean, and you, and you know, you can make meaningless symbols have meaning. You know, as we've discussed, Nike made the swoosh have meaning. It was just a swoosh of nothing, but it. Um, I don't know that we're going to have that kind of marketing muscle to turn, the, to turn that into something. But, okay. but sure, that'd be that'd be interesting. I think you might try, you know, well, the things we've been talking about, and maybe take a stab at one without without an icon. Okay, just to see, see the contrast. One or two without an icon. Yeah. But the only thing I would, and like I said, I don't mean to make it more difficult, but I, I know it's tough because the space is small, but. I just feel like the struggle with abstract continues, so I would be interested in seeing something that's not. And I, but I don't know what that is. I mean, I wish I did. I don't. Um, but we have to get closer to this because it's time to move on. So I really dollar don't symbols. <laughs> but we don't have any more than a week to decide. So it's time to. Could you move the stars up above Mass King and spread them out a little bit? There's potential. That's what I was suggesting, yeah. 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 I mean, 10 stars instead of five? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm Matching stars. Yeah. I think if you took them off the bottom, it wouldn't look as, you wouldn't notice a big gap on the bottom and just move them up on oh. the top. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think, you know, I mean, based on today's stars, conversation. I think on you know Three, just hearing two. this firsthand, oh, I think it's gonna it, it's gonna help us, uh, Lynn, who is our McCombs senior art director as well, well, to be able to to formulate some new ideas and come back with something that I think we can all agree upon. Yeah, and then maybe the, the last and final round, if you just maybe give us something that um, see it see the logo in, in, in action yep. a little bit, so that we can put some context. Exactly, to that. maybe that'd be helpful. That'll be huge. And, and, and Elaine, you want a decision by next week? I yeah. think I'm hearing that. Yes. Okay. Has to. Mm. Great. And so a split vote. If you put the stars up there, you'd play around with the formation. I mean, like you could have MacArthur's five stars, right? See, say that one more time. We're moving it from the top to the bottom, like or? You could put the stars up on top and, and rearrange the pattern so it was like a five-star general. Yeah. Uh, 
we can look to that. All right. I mean, that'd feel good. Yeah. Do you want to be the general? <laughs> you mean a judge, a commissioner, and a general? And a general. <laughs> I was happy to be the colonel. I didn't have to be the general. <laughs> well, now's your chance. <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, that's, All right, perfect. That's yeah. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Move this you while you're here, do you have anything else that you really I think, think um, it's um, No, um, thank you. And um, no, I think uh, beyond, I'm going to start um, determining what the community outreach um, strategy will be around um, soliciting feedback on policy um, questions because I think that that's really important. In the meantime, the good news is too is in addition to the current website, we have Facebook and Twitter and other elements to do that. So, um, and uh, I'm just working on a draft press release at this point that can go out this afternoon, but maybe at this point it's best to hold it until tomorrow. Um, and um, also just promoting uh, upcoming um, uh, speaking engagements that we have because we have several coming up in the yeah, next month. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bob and Guy, you want to come back? Thanks, folks. Thank, Thank you. you. I forgot to get my answers into Enrico. Um, we know you have a train to catch, so oh, yes. if, okay. don't, if, you, if, if we're still in the middle of stuff, and it's gravy to have you guys here for this conversation. It wasn't, it wasn't an absolute, so. Um, There's not much left no in our state anyway right now, <laughs> right. so uh, we have a little yeah. extra time. All right. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, well, RFA 2. Uh, where can we, do we want to talk about that before we get into the uh, policy questions, just right. the status report? Right. Well, uh, it, actually, a lot of the RFA two is, is dependent on the yeah, policy right. questions because what we what we've done you you you've laid it out here, and what we've uh, done is prioritize those regulations in the second phase that need to be done at certain times, those that are needed immediately, those a little later, and those ultimately. Uh, and a lot of those depend on what determinations the Commission makes on these policy questions so that uh, we're given guidance on how to proceed on them. So we would, we would address the policy questions that are prioritized as one and then uh, draft regulations in that regard and then proceed from there. Right. Okay. And just to reiterate, the policy questions were um, put together from a host of places, including initially issues you all raised, mm -hmm. um, to do two things. One is to inform the regs, uh, right. and two is to make sure that the bidders and the municipalities have an early heads up on a lot of relevant matters uh, right. that we will be talking about. Um, maybe we should talk about the, pr the schedule and the process. John, do you want to come? This is sort of out of your sequence, but let's. Um, I th what I think I'd, would make sense is to talk about the process for this for these things. Um, as well as then to run through them where we've got some feedback already. Uh, what we've talked about doing up until now is assigning these out to all the commissioners who will then work on their, their set. Uh, within a month of that time, which would be the first week of December, we had hoped that we would all be prepared to lead a discussion uh, to an answer on each of these, to a decision on each of these. And we have talked, uh, tentatively at least, about scheduling Monday through Thursday or Monday through Friday mornings where we would have public meetings uh, that second week of December and simply run through all of them um, and resolve them. We also said, and it was kind of informal, that we thought it made sense to post these and let people comment. Uh, I was initially thinking comment on the, on the questions themselves, but people have also raised other questions that they think should be added to the mix. Um, so I, th I think it makes sense to formalize what our what our public comment time is going to be. And John has gotten some feedback and has got some ideas on that. So do you want to fill us in a little bit? Sure. Um, I've been in contact with uh, most of uh, the contact persons at the municipalities that are potential host communities over the last week. 
and I've also been in touch with a number of the potential applicants, at least those that have been identified today. Uh, I think these haven't been very extensive conversations in many regards, but I did bring up the issues of the, the policy questions and highlighted that specifically for the municipalities. And my recommendation is that because these policy questions and the answers that we come up with will have pretty far-ranging impacts, that we uh, formalize the process for input by municipalities and or by the development community. Um, and part of that should be a deadline that we set by which comments should be submitted by these communities. Uh, given that uh, conversations have gone on for this past week about uh, the fact that these uh, questions are out there, but I, I think anything before two weeks from now would really be uh, fairly too early for people to be able to respond um, um, in an intelligent manner. Uh, if, if it's two weeks from, from today, that puts us right before the Thanksgiving deadline. Uh, if indeed we could push it forward one additional week, um, that might be even better, might give communities and, and development community a little bit more time to provide uh, reasoned responses. But again, that does push it against our December deadlines, and we will need some time to uh, take into account some of the uh, some of the input that we receive over, the, over that time. Uh, we've also been highlighting the policy questions to some of the regional planning agencies as well. Um, they will be important in, in helping us uh, work through some of these issues, you know, particularly some of the issues regarding surrounding communities and other ones that are that are on the uh, on the agenda. And uh, the idea, I just want to come back to uh, the original notion, would be to um, to put these questions for comments uh, about the questions, or to include um, additional questions. Because um, I think maybe we need to um, I don't th see any, think about what that. Yeah, I don't see any harm in, in getting in both. Additional both. Yeah, well, I, we hadn't really thought about that, but I've already got some additional questions here on right. for the discussion today. Um, I think that'd be fine. So, what what about the timing? If we if the, the pressure to move quickly isn't coming from us, it's tending to come from the outside world. Um, but if we we had talked about being ready to go by the first week in December, if we if we waited, see, two weeks from now would be the 20th, three weeks from now would be the 27th, which would be after Thanksgiving. Uh, we would need at least two weeks, so that would bump us a week later into December, by which time we could get these resolved. You know, I'm, you know I, I could go either way. Does anybody have? I think the um, <clears throat> desirability of getting full community Regional Planning Association input uh, ought to be the driver. And if we take a week longer to ensure that we've gotten that, I think we'd be better off doing that uh, and push push the um, discussion back a week yeah. uh, if necessary. So um, I think it's I think it's it, going through my own t uh, little chunk of this thing is in preparation for today's meeting, just trying to figure out where we're going to go to get the information. There was a lot of things that really are dependent on, on what communities and regional planning groups have to offer, and, and, uh, and I see that everybody else has got that, too, so I, that's where I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> I would also uh, mention and, uh, that, that we be proactive in communicating that this is not the only opportunity to make comments. There's clearly, there will be a, a right. formal process on our regulations. In fact, many of these um, questions will require a regulation, and, and that is, is a, a you know, good public process uh, right. by design. But um, so that the deadline, if you will, uh, is not interpreted as the only opportunity What's for important people. Point. I, I think that's really important, but at the same time, I think it's really important, as, we, as we've talked about before, to, to be as comprehensive now as we can, yes. because the regulations are going to take a while to develop, and people are in the middle of planning, communities and developers, and to have some idea of what the regulation, pretty good idea, what the regulations are going to say and the tax they're going to take is something I think we've been hearing the need for from the beginning. And so... Well, that's absolutely right, and people ought to understand there'll be another, there'll never be an opportunity. I take a look at that other opportunity really as sort of a fine-tuning kind of thing, rather than a global uh, strategy. Kind oh, of this thing. is this is clearly uh, within the 
the, our mission of being participatory. Yeah. It's let's let's be the most participatory at the beginning, where it really right. matters right. the most. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, disagree. Yeah. Right. Mr. Chairman, a little more detail regarding the exact process of review of the policy decisions when they occur in December, when, when, when we're ready to make that might be useful to you know, both communities and potential applicants, as in, uh, are we going to put forward a draft policy statement for consideration uh, by the full commission uh, prior to each of those dates? Uh, will it just be the general discussion based on some of the additional research? Those are the types of things that might be helpful to you know, uh, folks in the audience and, and the outside world. Well, what, what we had talked about, so if we, if we go with the three weeks, that would mean um, from now until the 27th, and you and Elaine could work together to get th this up with the right language around it, if not today, tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and we would invite answers to the question, comments on the questions and propose other questions, but it's important to note that we're not talking about small bore questions here. There are a lot of people have started to send in small bore. These are meant to be pretty high-end policy questions um, that, uh, that need to be decided early on, um, not, you know, how much change are we going to count at the desk at the end of the day kind of thing. Um, so, uh, so that should be reflected in what's posted. So that would be until the 27th. Then I would think it would be the third uh, and the tenth would be two more weeks, uh, by which time hopefully we would all be teed up. So the week of the tenth through the seventeenth would be the week, the week before Christmas would be the week where we would try to really churn through all these things and 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 deal with them. We'd hope to have you guys here, I think, yeah. for that week. Uh, and I think it's not unreasonable to say that we would want from each commissioner a, a write-up, a little proposed right. position paper. It's, it's going to be a lot of work, but that's life. Um, and I don't know whether we, would we post those. The question that John is asking is he, he, we want to tell the world, give the world as much specificity about our process as possible. Would we want to post those prior to our public meeting the week of the 10th through the 17th when we are discussing them? In an ideal world, I think uh, that it, that would be great. I, I have doubt about our ability to do that. And these are uh, uh, policy determinations, uh, uh, and uh, they can be revised and tempered as we move forward. Uh, we'll probably revise and temper them in the discussion. And I think that the try to post them and then take comments about them then decide them is uh, going to, in, a, after the comments come in, uh, is uh, going to uh, sacrifice our ability to get things done in the interest of being fully, uh, in the interest of being participatory in a way that's not necessarily going to yield a lot at that stage, I think. The, the initial stage for people <coughs> to make comments as to what we're going to do absorb, listen to those comments, take them, try to weave them into the policy, discuss the policy, shape the policy, tailor the policy, and then write regulations that we're then going to put through the extensive uh, public comment period, I think really will allow us to be both participatory, transparent, and efficient. Uh, and so that's, that's what I would strive to do. So two yeah. opportunities to comment is right. appropriate. Right. I and I, th I think if it turns out that I mean, <clears throat> rather than say we will post written positions, if, I think we might where we where we can where we you know if we decide we can uh, maybe we will. Uh, <coughs> but I think well let's well not I, I agree with Commissioner McHugh. Let's not set that out as a as a firm commitment. The other place where we may, Mr. Chairman, want to post something would be after a discussion. If we run into a particularly thorny problem yeah. as to which we think we need more community input, right. then we could cull out those right. and put them up and say, yeah. and here I, we are. Yeah. We, need, and, we need some more help with this. And I've thought about, in some of my uh, sessions, I've suggested that we need public 
public hearing. Right. I'd like to have an opportunity for people to come in and talk to us about it. Right. Uh, so that would be another option. And, right. and many of them, in particular, the ones I have, are really not something I think the public has any knowledge of. They really are specific to gaming operations, which it's much more valuable for us to consult with our with our gaming consultants and or other uh, other jurisdictions and what what the best practices are. So it's really not something I think there'd be a lot of comment about. Right. Would it be helpful um, for us to try to, uh, this certainly applies to some questions more than others, uh, but would it be helpful to try to um, uh, put in the pros and cons on, on, on each of the, uh, the policy questions where, where these may apply. Um, just reminded of uh, questions that I voted in this morning, that you know, <laughs> what a yes vote would do or what a, <coughs> what a no vote would do uh, to facilitate understanding uh, of, of our... Some of the questions may require that, but others I think would I, not. I, I, I understand that. I'm, I'm right. just thinking of alternatives to at least some mm -hmm. of the questions. Yeah. I think as we get closer to the to that period, we, you know, I'll be talking with everybody about theirs and, and where we feel like we really need a little bit of a position paper, we can, we can look at one and, and work on. Um, so I don't think we're going to set that out as a parameter. So um, Jamie, did you get those dates? Um, when Did you get those se sequence of dates I was just talking about? Yeah, the, the December week. Yeah. Yes. And so that week, that we ought to freeze the week of the 10th through the 17th right. for we have all a, of us. We have a potential conflict. The AIA came back to us <coughs> wanted to do their presentation to us in the morning of the 12th. Oh, all right. Well, of the same week 12th? Be yeah. Then, yeah. Then we can have have them be in the afternoon, or we can do it. I don't know. We'll have to figure that out. But, but we just we, we can get Janice on that you know, when she gets back. But just make sure that those dates are start to get locked down in everybody's calendar. Um, okay, anything else on the process here? Yeah, just one other yeah. thing, uh, Chairman. Um, we briefly discussed this with Commissioner McHugh. Uh, you know, there's a possibility that some of the policy determinations here would not necessarily result in regulations. Um, there is a possibility of making, you know, clarifying statements and, uh, you know, general policy statements of, of some format uh, that might still be issued at, at an appropriate time. So. Um, you know, we'll also look at the list in that regard if there's any of those that are identifiable in that regard. So the first step you've talked about in terms of getting input even covers that because you wouldn't necessarily have the regulation public input, but you would have it in terms of these questions. So mm -hmm. It'd be covered either way, but there are areas in here that we see that, uh, you know, may not be subject to a specific regulation, but would be something that the Commission's position should be known so that applicants would have guidance and the public right. would be made aware. Right. So you're saying you were going to you were going to call those out? Is that what well, you're we'll, we'll look through it. Yes. See if there's any of those areas that we okay. can identify for you. Okay. Thank you. That's yeah. helpful. Um, there was one. Did anybody else have red? Yeah, there are some other reds. Okay. Um, well, I, I had had one. I sent around a note saying that uh, I was going to suggest that we vote today on, it's on the first page. It's the same question, pretty much, 16 and 31. Nope, sorry, 16 and 45, yeah, okay. Uh, so, should the commission confirm through a formal policy that no host community <coughs> agreement should be executed or referenda held before the relevant applicant has qualified through RFA 1? That was the thrust of our concern with Springfield. Um, and. I was originally thinking that we've talked about that so much that it was pretty much a known fact to, to everybody, um, but it might be good if we formalized what has been an informal, I think, an informal agreement on our parts. Um, but John had some uh, concerns about that. so. Uh, I think my major concern is that if we're putting these policy questions out to the general world, uh, people may have different determinations about each one of these policy questions, and that is a pretty big one with, with the development community and with uh, uh, communities that are trying to move very quickly. So even if uh, um, in the minds of the commission that uh, a decision may be made that would be the same as the de decision today, I think <coughs> as part of a due process point of view, it would make sense to get the input of both the communities and the development community in that. Uh, 
Now, the mitigation agreement, as I, as I stated earlier, is it, it is something that sets a lot of other things uh, in process, uh, uh, and a lot of resources, at least on the development level, will be uh, forthcoming after the mitigation agreement. So, um, th there's a level of certainty that people want on that agreement. But giving folks another uh, three weeks to opine on that matter might not uh, interrupt anything at the local level, especially if you reference the Springfield uh, question. They put, put out an RFP process the other day, um, and it doesn't look like they're going to be coming to any mitigation agreement within the next three weeks. So. In that regard, I don't know if there's any danger, um, specifically with that proposal, of moving forward in the absence of, of something by the commission today. I'd agree with that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I think um, as part of this discussion, um, which we, we have had and which we've uh, attained, uh, obtained the agreement of the Springfield authorities to, we're going to abide by this. Uh, we need to think through, as part of the policy, what the consequences of failing to follow the policy are. Uh, this policy, as it's directed here, is no community should do it. Well, um, uh, are we content to leave it at that and leave, for the regulation issuing process, the consequences of doing it before the qualification, or should we uh, make it part of the policy to articulate a, the Commission won't consider a host community agreement as a host community agreement if it's done before the qualification process. But I just throw that out as a hypothetical. But that's an important part of whatever policy we uh, ultimately adopt. And I think we need to think that through. Right. Yeah. And just uh, <coughs> ancillary to that, uh, you are much closer to this than we are, but in our meetings today uh, and yesterday with the applicants and the interested parties, uh, there, when you mentioned earlier whether they had asked any questions about process and uh, for me this was the question that came up most frequently was how does this process, the state process, interact with any of the local processes? What happens to us if we're not chosen locally and then we're in the middle of an investigation from the state? Uh, is our, is our uh, license fee refundable? Are those kinds of uh, of uh, ancillary questions that arise as an impact of this determination are some parts of all of this. Yeah. Well, I don't have a problem with that. I just I said to John, I said to John that that um, my view my view is that people don't know the answer to this question. They haven't been listening to our meetings, and I wouldn't want there to be any misunderstanding on this. I think the words are chosen carefully. It says I. No host agreement executed, right. nor referendum voted on. Um, you can negotiate to your heart's content, but don't close the deal until we know whether a party has been approved. Um, and incidentally, I would think by now, by looking at this, people would also see that there are any number of other issues that we will be addressing, which will no doubt be reflected in the host community agreement. So um, having said that, I, I, I agree with you. So uh, I don't have a problem with, with holding that one also. Okay. Well, should, should I just run through mine quickly here and see whether there's anything really to talk about? Um, the surrounding communities question, uh, we talked about a lot, and John is picking up that ball. We're going to talk with the RPAs, uh, our own law firms. It's a level two priority. It doesn't have to be done immediately, but it's a, it's, it's a pretty important one. Could, could I just interrupt yeah. for a second here, yep. then? Because this is, this is a question that I had, and <clears throat> I thought I understood the answer, what the answer was, but I, I realized I don't. The process you've just described has us formulating policies during the early week of December. That's what we've talked about all along. Well, what is the significance of one, two, and three on that timetable? Yeah. Are, are we going to are we going to concentrate on, for example, during that week on ones, and to the extent we finish ones, do twos. And to the extent we finish twos, do threes, and if we come to the end of the week and we haven't finished all the twos or the threes, stop anyway, or, or are we going to approach this in some other fashion? I'm glad you asked that question because when I um, first thought of the one, two, and three, um, I assumed, perhaps incorrectly, that we would be deciding on a rolling basis starting 
as early as today, let's say, if we were to decide on on a, pub, on a policy about the host community agreements, which we won't for at least a couple of weeks. Um, hence the one, two, and three, um, which you know concentrate on the ones and, and continue thereafter. But if all decisions or most decisions will be made for some period of week in, in um, for, for a week in December, um, it becomes perhaps just two notions here, the ones that are decided then and the ones that are decided later uh, by virtue of regulations phase three. And I'm just gonna picking something that, um, speculating, if you will. We could, we could easily do, a put, I mean, take that chunk of time in December, give it our best shot, finish the ones, we surely will, get into the two, start drafting regulations with respect to those, and then come back to the others and say January, so... If we, that, have, if we haven't got through yeah, it. if we haven't got through yeah. it. And, and that way we have time to do a orderly, thoughtful consideration of things like what's the enforcement mechanisms mm -hmm. for, uh, for right. somebody who doesn't do this. And uh, we don't have to, don't have to, and, and concentrate on that, and don't have to sort of intersperse these things with other ongoing business that we have every week. Yeah. That, that would be my preference. I, I would pretty much agree with that. I, I, I thought maybe red might have some particular significance. For example, I thought up until a minute ago that we ought to move on uh, question 16 today. And maybe others, <coughs> other people will see reds. I don't know. But you, know, you might, somebody might say we ought to address something sooner than our process. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I think what you said is right, that we should use the week of the 10 for the ones and twos for sure, and as many of the threes as we can get to. Now, there's only one other red. Okay. So well, some of these should be viewed as preliminary or, big, or potentially big changing. Red. Yeah. A big red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But I didn't have any red. So is that sure to that answer? Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. So, so, you know, a green, here's a green. Should the commission prohibit gambling by local officials in casinos located within their jurisdictions? We got a long time to answer right. that question. Right. So right. if we right. don't get around to that right. in December, that's it's green. Right. Yeah. That's right. green. Right. Right. Okay. Did, I just had one quick question. Do we need to go through question by question since the only thing we did is identify who needs to help us with this and what level of priority? Um, and if there's a document, I'm just not sure if going through question by question. <coughs> I, I think you might be right. Um, I guess maybe a qu first question should be, is there anything else that anybody um, really wants to, uh, wants to raise right now about this, particularly while we have the consultants here or that's particularly pressing? Yeah, I, I, I thought of something which um, applies to a, a number of questions and perhaps talks a little bit about process. So, some of these questions... Uh, particularly the ones about scoring or the minimum requirements. Um, perhaps they, they, they could be thought of as certain prerequisites that the Gaming <coughs> Act requires, uh, and then additional criteria that either the Commission can impose on those prerequisites or um, an aspect that could qualify as a stronger um, submission to the Commission. Um, I can pick one or, or a couple, but um, uh, equity participation. There's this question about debt, debt to equity. Uh, could we, should we prescribe uh, an equity participation of, of, of um, an applicant? Uh, and that, in my mind, could be structured both ways as a prerequisite, above which the more equity participation is the more favorable, uh, thus uh, somebody competing against somebody else uh, may be viewed uh, more favorably by virtue of how much equity they have. If, if the commission decides that, that that's a value uh, to the Commonwealth, which I, I happen to believe. Um, in other words, this, this notion that there's, there's this theme that could cut across um, some of these questions uh, that I think I just wanted to mention. Um, as we um, have our consultants here to uh, uh, either comment on that uh, notion with, uh, where other jurisdictions may have set this distinction between prerequisites, what should always be left as prerequisite, 
are what should perhaps be thought of as letting people be creative and compete on the notions. Um, um, where, would, that, would your, would, would your uh, that, that may be part of the policy decision itself, but would your, your thought in that regard say we set a, one of the alternatives is to set a minimum threshold and then say beyond that minimum we consider favorably as opposed to just saying here's the minimum and Right. Well, I, I, I just it, it just occurred to me that there were a number of questions that had this theme, yeah. and uh, yeah. th this theme of you know we could we could be um, li liberal in the sense let let respondents propose the best uh, uh, alternative let's say, or could we uh, take a look at what the gaming act prescribes as a prerequisite, or we could even move that requisite uh, higher. The licensing fee is another one, um, you know, where, where uh, we're pondering whether we should up that, which is a clear prerequisite of the Gaming Act. Um, anyway. Well, if we, well, it's just to, if I could, the, um, the first kind of hypothetical that you raised with regard to the equity and, and debt ratios. Uh, that's, it's not unusual for uh, a jurisdiction to, usually a standard is financial stability, and that's the general statutory standard, and then a jurisdiction will establish regulations that further define what constitutes a financially stable corporation. Uh, then you get into the issue that runs through all the regulation, and that is how specific do you make the rule, or how much discretion do you give the applicant? Uh, that that is that's a, 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 an issue that is part of every kind, especially when we get into the gaming operation stuff. Uh, do you impose specific internal controls on every casino, or do you let the casinos provide you with what they consider to be sufficient, and you tell them whether you think it's sufficient? Um, and that's a policy judgment that I think is is in here as well, in terms of what the regulations, how they are drafted, generally or more specifically, um, with. With regard to uh, the second part about raising the raising the uh, investment requirement, that again, that's that is purely a discretionary judgment. That's uh, something that's not the, the statute does mandate a specific investment requirement, and it says or such additional requirement as the commission may determine. So you have that that authority right away. But the in terms of uh, in, in, it, there has to be a balance struck between being you know, the commission imposing its view on the applicants and saying this is the way you must structure your organization uh, and giving too much leeway so that there's really no efficient standard. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm helping any except to say that it's, it's, a, it's a difficult balance, but it's a balance that you're going to be asked to strike. I, I just want to add one thing, and that would be, um, you know, I would suggest re remaining mindful of the fact that the industry today is so highly competitive that the uh, creativity of the of the uh, individual applicants is going to weigh heavily on a success of the property. Uh, the statute has floors for investment and so forth, and you know just in our preliminary discussions and so forth, uh, uh, you know we, we get the sense that obviously there's going to be, and you've seen from some of the media reports that. Um, some of the applicants are going way beyond the minimums in terms of their proposals. That's expected. Uh, the quality of it and so forth is what you'll be getting into as the proposals roll out more and more detail. Uh, in terms of establishing your, your regulatory framework um, and, you know, shackling to a certain uh, degree uh, the applicants from having the maximum creativity they can, uh, as long as you assure the fundamental you know, soundness of what they're proposing. Uh, is something that in, in today's uh, gaming market, and particularly the fact that, you know, we're surrounded by jurisdictions that, that have highly competitive uh, facilities, um, you know, it, the balance that has to be struck has to consider that, that you're looking for uh, good, solid investments, large investments, uh, but getting into some of the, um, you know, pe peculiar uh, aspects of some statutes where there's, you know, hotel room to gaming floor ratios and things of that sort, um, you know, some of that stuff uh, started out in original statutory schemes and was later removed in other jurisdictions to generate, you know, bigger and better and, and more creative properties. So, 
you know, you have it, you have your floors established, and I, I think it would be prudent to look at those as you see the different applications coming in. Um, how far you want to go, though, in specifically requiring uh, specifics is something that, um, you know, has to be balanced to the overall potential saleability, if you will, of the property as a whole, because bottom line is has to be attractive and the revenue has to roll in and, and, and compete with some pretty heavy properties that you're, you're facing already. So, and One of the other problems that being was too specific is that you end up with a cookie cutter approach. Everybody is going to be proposing the same thing the same because thing. they're all meeting these specific standards. Uh, and there's nothing really to score. Everybody's going to look the same. Uh, so it, the, to the extent you can give leeway and discretion on the part of the applicants to as I said, be creative and provide you differences, uh, it, it's, it's helpful. One of the things that I thought, uh, and that's really helpful, uh, one of the things that I thought I heard uh, Commissioner Zuniga saying, though, was uh, something like to, to go to the debt to equity uh, thing. Mm -hmm. of, of, uh, a debt to equity ratio of X to Y is a floor. The commission will consider a higher percentage of equity to be a favorable component of an application. Have you ever seen that kind of thing done? So it's sort of a, here's the floor, do whatever you want, but uh, we would like you to think about more equity. Uh, and more without, without, you don't have to. But yeah. More, more <laughs> under the heading of, of, of you know, general, of general um, a project proposal size, amount of commitment, and so forth. Right. Uh, um, you know, you can have a, a debt to equity ratio that, um, you know, from a, from a big player, so to speak, um, that if, it, if a smaller player would propose that, it may be a little riskier, okay? Uh, by the same token, the, the quality of the project and so forth and the, the financial stability of the project uh, the regulations and the, or the, the statute already requires specificity that you'll be able to get a pretty good feel for that already. Um, if you were to establish, uh, you know, go further than the statute and require some additional um, uh, specific ratio minimums, so to speak, um, you know, it might affect the applicants differently depending on where they come into the, into, into the uh, particular uh, process. Uh, and it's something that um, it would have effect could have a, you know, a real effect on it. I'm, I'm not sure uh, at this point um, um, whether that would be a factor, okay, uh, you know, that, that, that we were, we anticipate uh, facing, but it's something that, um, you know, we keep coming back to looking at the opportunity here to be something that uh, these, these big players, if you will, the players that are coming in are going to be putting a lot of money, a lot of capital investment, and you want the most attractive and the most sellable property possible. And, uh, as long as you can, you can prescribe all the necessary minimums, uh, put in whatever additional safeguards you're comfortable with. Um, you really have to balance it, you know, situation by situation, because you're going to get diverse, you know, presentations. Your your, pro your applications are going to be certainly yeah, different. And, and diverse presenters. Yeah, I think that's if, if one company has a billion dollars in cash flow and another has barely surviving. Uh, the kind of debt to equity ratio that they both propose is going to be had to be viewed in the context of the company's ability to, to survive that ratio. If, if you set a specific standard that everybody has to meet, even if it's a floor, it may not be necessary for one company to still be very stable, uh, but yet it may be for another. And I'm not sure that the uniformity there is a, is a value. Well, that's a fascinating um, Observation because it it um, it uh, raises for me the question of how we get our handle around uh, how we get our hands around when uh, a floor is appropriate and when it isn't. I mean, if if we move, for example, to numbers of rooms in a hotel, we've heard, uh, for example, that uh, a number of um, casinos have perhaps all have rooms reserved for their patrons, and, and uh, so 300, 400 rooms is a, some, somewhere in the ballpark. So, so uh, if, we, if, uh, if we said that uh, you had to have 20% of your rooms reserved for, available for non-gaming patrons, hypothetically, uh, and uh, more rooms reserved for non-gaming, the more rooms, that's the minimum, but the more the better. 
in terms of the way the commission will look at your application. I mean, that's another variant of the same right. thing as we were talking about with the debt to equity ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we decide whether that is that kind of approach is ever appropriate as opposed to saying, give us your best shot as to how many rooms you're going to have for what? Uh, experience, I think, would be the uh, principal place to look. And typically, in areas such as that, where you're dealing with uh, the marketing philosophy right. of, a, of a particular company, um, this, uh, the regulator is not really in the best position always to make that kind of a judgment. There may be a, a certain public policy that you want to enforce and say we're going to, uh, we would, we, we uh, encourage you to leave rooms available for non, for, for, play, for non-player guests. Uh, but you could run into a serious problem if you, for example, mandate 20% be set aside and then 20% of the rooms are empty uh, on a consistent basis. Uh, that's uh, that's not a good situation to be in, and and the commission will be blamed for it. And that and that criteria could be affected obviously by the size of the project. It's a thousand room project versus a three hundred room. Right. Twenty percent can have a material right. difference right. on the bottom right. line. Right. 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 So uh, there, okay. I don't see any solution but to think about these ones. Right. Each one of these almost, right. in, you know, because right. you know the, the debt to equity. If you have a four which you think guarantees a stable operation. Increasing the, the debt, I mean, increasing the, the equity might drive, you know, more credit to the deal, but they're doing that by taking away from things you care more about, you know. So it, it, there's a law of unintended consequences on a lot of these things, I think, what we're seeing. So we're, we're going to have to really think carefully through each each one of these variables. Well, if, um, I, I, I agree, but uh, if nothing else, adding... Uh, specificity to any one of the given floors mm -hmm. um, you know for example level of investment we already got a question as to what would count towards that um, level of investment whether for example capitalized interest would be allowed to be count I have my own opinion about that uh, you know there's there's costs that are um, Clearly, more an invest investment related, whereas others may not, and that's that's really what we ought to be thinking about. Right. All right. Uh, there, there are a couple more reds here. Let me just mention them uh, on my side. Uh, one was: Will the commission promulgate additional ethics or reporting standards for applicants and/or related municipalities? And I had put that as need immediate attention. <laughs> But I don't see any reason not to have it fall in the same window that we've now talked about. Wait for three weeks. Um, did anybody else have reds? I had a question. Uh, there's a red on uh, page uh, two, Mr. Chairman. Question 32 at the bottom is a one-two. Mm -hmm. And um, my thought, uh, uh, so that's a, a possibility as a, as a one. And that one, um, I, I just, I'm going to stop by just flagging that. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let me just jump on that. I, I do think, I don't know where this goes, but I do think that um, I would not want to agree to wait for three weeks before we do something or other. We don't, right. I think right. this is something we, we're trying to figure out how to think about, right. and um, I would want to reserve, be sure to reserve the right to bring this one up. In the old time now, I, I, I join you there, but but I just don't yeah. have anything substantive to say. Right, no, I understand. But uh, we're not we're not putting that one this right. into the three week category necessarily. Right. And then um, uh, it struck me that on the next page, number four, that the first one is a two. Question number four. The first one is a two. Uh, it struck me that that we should think about making a one. Um, it's, it goes with five, yes. and I've mm -hmm. designated that five falls in my bucket, and I've designated five as a one, and I think this one should be a one as well. I agree. Uh, because I think that the planning process right now is focusing on these kinds of things, and people are trying to get their plans together. Yep. So I, I would upgrade that one to a one. Okay. 
And then my, then I have a, uh, on my bucket on page, I don't have any numbers on these pages, but it's page section five. Four. Section four. Section four. First question is question five. I've got that as a one or a two. I think I'd strike the two. Yeah. That is but fine within the three week time frame. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Mm -hmm. no. okay. I, mine aren't listed yeah, on the sheet, but I did not have any reds. They were all okay. well down the road. Yours are all whites. I had greens and yellows. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything, um, well, first of all, we've got 15 more minutes from the consultants. Did anything pop out at, from you while you, I know you haven't had a chance to really look at these, but was there anything that popped out at you that you want to say to us as we're jumping off and just starting to work on these? Uh, no, only that, not that we don't have enough work to do already, but some of the areas here that we were not listed in as, uh, as big input, we would be available, obviously, to do that. Some of them, for example, the one that that you just mentioned there, uh, number five uh, under uh, yeah, number sure. four, yeah. on the, anything involving the, the regulation drafting we'd like to be involved in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just as a warning. Kind of assume. As a clerical, I was going to assume that you're under all of these. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention that as a, oh, yeah, perhaps right. a clerical, I had you in all of mine okay. too. Right. A clerical right. correction Almost was right. uh, sometimes we use consultants or gaming consultants indistinctively. Okay. So uh, just well, then, uh, strike, that, that, strike that last remark. Yeah. We, wanted the record. we wanted to lock in your rate before we got into it. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, okay, and did anybody, any commissioners have any questions or any issues? Um, just a, a, a quick technicality, I think on the last page, even though this set of questions falls under Commissioner Cameron, I had offered to take 33 and 34 relative to the community college training process and the uh, uh, and private I had, training schools. I had, um, I had given those to you, Commissioner. So thank you for the offer. I vouched for him, and I'll take him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you and raise you five. <laughs> okay, I, I think you're right, uh, Commissioner Cameron. There's no need to go through these. Um, it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, the only question I had is, are we going to be on our own to just make phone calls and well, let's, gather yeah, information? Good question. Thank you. Um, how do you want us to handle this? We, as you see, we've broken these up amongst all of us, all right. and we increasingly we're putting our time into starting to work on these. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want us to contact you willy-nilly on our parts? Do, should we come through one of us? Should we go through Kathy? What's the best way to Why don't do we it? work with Janice on setting up a schedule where each commissioner, we can arrange to be on a conference call with each commissioner individually, and that way we can focus on that commissioner's concerns and then kind of run through the whole body of commissioners and then, you know, and otherwise be available, of course. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of focus, I can run through that. Excellent idea. Okay. So maybe starting we'll contact you yeah, next, next week or two, Jamie, um, next week or two, um, by that time, we will have teed up our questions. Okay. okay. Good. Great. There, in the same vein, Mr. Chairman, uh, there's a number of us that are reaching out to the same sources, the regional planning commissions and the like, and we ought to coordinate that, I think, through John so that we're not, uh, we're not getting calls disjointed, perhaps, from <coughs> us and, and yep. Yep. and so yeah, and I, I, go ahead, excuse me. And I guess the other thing is it might be worthwhile as we populate um, the who we're going to contact, uh, who, whose input is needed piece of this, that we ought to find a way internally to exchange who we're thinking about contacting so <coughs> that if somebody else is going to contact them for a related purpose, we can try and minimize the imposition on the people we're contacting and package our requests um, so that we only hit them once. Otherwise, there are some people who are going to wear out, potentially. And I, I think we could do that. Um, uh, we could figure out a way to do that as well. Well, right now we've got 
this document that's right. that's growing, and we can continue to use this. You know, and it'll go back presumably to Eileen. Yep. Um, and perhaps if we, put, uh, I don't want to take our time to get too yeah, right. fine board. Maybe we post it in a common place and and add to it there, and then invite people's attention. I'm about to contact somebody. And, ABCC, for example. Yeah, we, we, we should designate um, a yeah. place in the sh in the shared drive to, uh, to file okay. always the, the latest by some time. Let's say the latest version. Or it's always yeah. there. Oh, we just all add. Or it's to always it. there. Right. It's really probably ought to be Janice to manage this since it's our work rather than Eileen. But we can figure that out. Um, yeah, and I think maybe by by this time next week, if not before, um, if we if we're going to see any special needs, like for example, public hearings, you know, are, going, are we going to want some public hearings that we want to schedule either people coming to one of our meetings or a separate meeting, whatever? If you've got, if any commissioners got requests, we've got people you're going to want to reach out to. You've got time with the, com the consultants and any other kind of special logistical help, particularly public meetings or anything. If you can ready to tell us mm -hmm. so to be, maybe give us the lay of the land on your research by next Tuesday right. Right. I did get um, some questions from the UAW. They were recommending two additional questions, but I think rather than deal with that now, we might as well put them into the queue for um, for three weeks from now. Right. Are they on there already? They're already included here. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. We had received them last last week. Yeah. So you are, well, well, I don't know whether we want to add them or not. Okay. Um, we can, they can go in a different bucket or we're, we're, 50 and 51. On which page is that? It's Under second to last page. Second to last page. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I think we ought to hold. These are all ones that we've agreed on already that okay. should go in here. Okay. Uh, I actually thought some of these might be too too granular to really fit this category. Yep. Um, so why don't we just hold these, maybe pull them off this list and put them into the, the three-week category. Okay that we're going to get by the end of three weeks where we're going to get the public feedback from everybody. Okay. So that's, uh, the, what do we say, November 27th. Okay. You get that? Yep. Okay. All right. Anything else with this? Um, I think we're all set. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Have a good trip back. Thank you. Hope you got water and heat. It's back. Well, we are anyway. Using the power. Yeah. Okay. You don't have power? Not in the office yet. No, oh, in the office. Yeah, so we we're in Point Pleasant. We had the luxury of being on the uh, northern the northern end of Point Pleasant, the southern end of Atlantic City. So mm -hmm. we got pincered. <laughs> Great. You're welcome to stay here for another week. <laughs> Appreciate it. Pleasant See you later. Okay. Project management chart. We lost. Oh, there's Eileen. Okay. Good. Are you? Do you have anything to talk about on the project management chart? It sounds like not. Next next week. Okay, because we had talked about where we want to go, but if it can be by next week, you know. All right. Um, status of the new ethics standards. Anything uh, to talk there about is there? There's nothing just to talk about in there. process. We, okay. We know we. That's a very high priority. We know we got to do that. Right. Okay. Um, we had uh, Commissioner uh, Dr Director Driscoll. Any, nothing else from you, right? Um, personnel searches. I think in general we we've got a bunch going on. I think we know what they are. I had one question um, that I don't quite have my arms around. When we get to the finalists for major, major, but not the final choice for major positions, but if we have more than one for major positions, executive director, IEB, general counsel, et cetera. Was it our plan to do the full, complete background check on everybody before 
we have them in for interviews and make the decisions? I know, I know we had made the decision we're not going to announce a choice until background checks were done. That's for sure. But it wasn't clear to me that we were going to do the complete background checks before we interviewed um, finalists. Well, I, th I think it's not clear until we get to that final phase if there's more than one candidate to interview before the four, full commission. I mean, it, it, because we don't know if there's there'll be one candidate that clearly stands out. Um, so I think, as there has been in some of our other searches, um, so I think it's premature to answer that question. I'm sure. I, I know with IEB, I, I you know I don't know yet if. And then we get into the same issues around uh, folks with other jobs, and so I, I don't. I certainly believe that we should complete the background investigation as we've been doing before we uh, bring that person before the full commission for for a well, sign so for a sign off for a sign off or a, 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 a final interview. Okay, but, we if, want to phrase but that. if there's if if for executive director, for example, if we're going to be interviewing more than one person, which there's a pretty good chance we will. Do we, have we agreed, and if so, why did we agree that all of them would have to have their background checks done before we would bring them in for the interviews? Because we... Mr. Chair, we, we, uh, we did, I remember talking about this in the context of the um, employee manual, um, which, you know, I can go back to, um, to the minutes and, and, uh, and the latest uh, draft work. But what I, what I recall is to give ourselves the flexibility to do either uh, uh, an approach, the two being uh, conduct one background check on one finalist if we, if we believe that was, uh, you know, um, um, important, or to, to do it on more than one person. I think well, we I, clearly I, made the decision yeah. not to bring anyone in the open public before the full commission without a background that's check right, complete. Right. That's and that yes. serves us well, and it serves the individual right. well. Yes. If that there's an happen. issue, there's no need for that to be public, frankly. That was my recollection as yes. well. We did not want to interview a finalist and select then a finalist who then failed the background investigation so that if we bring multiple finalists for the commission interview, those people all had passed the background check and were ready to go. And why is why did why is that? Why did we decide that? Because we did not want to have the uh, public embarrassment for the finalist and ourselves of selecting somebody who then didn't publicly selecting somebody as our executive directors say and then having that person subjected to a background right. investigation mm -hmm. that they fail. We need to do our due diligence. Right. right. But we wouldn't we wouldn't if we had three people come in to interview for position X, we wouldn't announce who we picked. If we if we picked somebody, we would say, okay, this is who we want, now we better do the background check and then see if that not for the ED. You have, you have to do that no. in the public meeting. First to be in a public yeah. meeting. You can't you can't if you have three finalists you can't pick somebody and then mm -hmm. like right. gonna be a vote. If we have a single finalist and then many of these appointments, if we get the executive director, many most of these appointments, if not all of them, are gonna be ultimately selected with a heavy uh, input by the executive director and that changes the ball game right, directly. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean dramatically, but Okay. Okay, fine. Um Another position that we've talked about, we postponed it till we had another meeting, but uh, I think we need to talk about and maybe resolve whether we want it or not. We have two major um, initiatives going on that are both dual faceted. One is we want to make sure that we get the maximum participation of local vendors and suppliers to the casinos. Um, and we want to make sure that those vendors and suppliers represent a diverse uh, group of suppliers. Similarly, we want to make sure that we employ as many of uh, Massachusetts citizens as possible and provide a qualified workforce for the uh, for gaming operators. And we want that workforce to be as diverse a workforce as possible. Um, we have some, particularly on the on the workforce, we have some people working on it at the community college. The effort at the 
supplier base is more fractured. There's really nobody that is ready to step, step up and say, we'll take the lead on this, although there are plenty of people who will help. But it, it, it seems to me that those are both really desirable objectives, and if we, if, if we really <coughs> focus our attention on it, we can do a good job of both of those. Um, but it would also be very easy to sort of do a half-assed effort and not, you know, not really get it buttoned up. Um, and I'm wondering whether it would be a good idea to search for and hire a director of local business and workforce development, whose job it would, whose job it would be to spend the next two and a half years to make sure that we really get our local workforce and our local suppliers teed up to maximize their participation with the gaming operation. I'm afraid it's one of those things that if it doesn't have somebody whose job it is, it isn't going to get done in the way we want it to get done. I think I'd like to hear more, see a job description. I can't, I'm just hearing about this for the first time. I'm not able to really um, visualize all that that job would entail. So I think I'd like to kind of hear more about that. Well, I think, I think it makes sense to, as I said, I just want to bring this up for, for discussion. I think it makes sense to flesh it out. What I'm, what I'm, on the supplier side, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to go around to the operators and say, what are you going to need? You know, what is, what's your, your outlay of what, what, are, what are you going to procure? How many people, how many pillow slips do you need? You know, how many whatevers? Um, and to put that down on a piece of paper and then go around to all the suppliers in Massachusetts and figure out who's, who's available to, to meet those needs, find out what the standards are, what the protocols are, what the financial checks are, whatever the criteria are that the operators use. If we find people that do carpeting but they're really not buttoned up enough, we help them learn how to do carpeting, we put them in touch with the Small Business Administration. So, and working with minority suppliers, going out of our way to identify minority suppliers and preparing them to learn how to deal with, with these folks. And, you know, that's just going to be a big labor-intensive job to really line those, to understand what the market is long enough in advance that we can get people ready to respond to it when the market puts it out there. If we do it really well, then we can put strong criteria requirements on the operators. But I don't want to. I don't think it's fair of us to put requirements out if the op, if the small business people aren't there to to meet the supply. Um, I think we're in better shape because the community college is um, is working on it. But you know the community college is the community college, and they're looking out for their own interests, which is fine. I mean they they reflect that one particular interest. They're not quite as aggressive as I would like to see them about involving other people. Maybe that may not be fair. Maybe they are doing it. I, I don't really know. But I think if we were there, making sure that the outreach to all the other kinds of groups were being done and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of my general sense. I, I uh, would like to hear more about it too because as you uh, talk about it, one of the things that uh, I think I've been concerned about, and I know we all have been concerned about, is how do you um, enforce some of the requirements that we're going to put into the license and the uh, uh, the uh, criteria we use to award the licenses uh, with respect to workforce, not only workforce development, but impact on uh, preservation of small businesses, uh, so that we don't so that we don't have cannibalization of small businesses. And there, there are going to be a lot of of efforts made by the developers and the towns. Um, and uh, by us uh, to ensure that those statutory goals are met. But how do we enforce that afterwards? And how do we keep ourselves in information afterwards that's necessary uh, to take enforcement and not simply rely on episodic complaints from time to time? And this kind of a person uh, play could uh, play that role yeah, as that's well. A, that's a good so, point. So I think it's really worth pursuing. <coughs> I'd like to see it, just to finish that, in the context of an <coughs> overall organizational chart. I know that our draft strategic plan right, is just still in incubation, uh, 
and uh, I'd like to I'd like to move that process along and and, and consider this in context of the overall organization chart. I, I was going to make a point to that. Um, we should look at it in, in terms of the strategic plan, which we should come back and approve, or uh, even though it, it, it will be a, a document that might evolve, uh, we, sh we, we need to look at it in the context of all the other positions and um, financial um, <coughs> implications of that as well. Okay. The, uh, you, yeah, what's talking with the community colleges that they, it, or Bob, who was at our last meeting, uh, I know they are going back and uh, starting to lay out their plan and a little bit more of a timetable, and I think they're due in front of us later this month to kind of give us that whole revision. I think we've been pretty adamant about encouraging them to reach out to their regional alliances that they're really adding the community action folks. So. I, I think from the training perspective, I think the, the community colleges have a have a kind of a stake in the action and a stake for their own credibility and reputation in seeing this through as a success. Um, and the supplier and vendor piece, um, and I thought I had asked to have it added into the agenda but didn't make it. Um, you know, we had a good meeting last week. I had a follow-up with ICIC that has initiated some of these vendor supplier programs with big institutions. Uh, only most recently working with casinos, but doing hospitals, colleges, and universities. And, uh, you know, again, my point, and I, I may still be at this point of uh, if, if there's an organization that we can partner with to share our financial resources to have a position or a responsibility or an agreement with, um, you know, may be preferable. I, it's kind of at an early stage to know. I, what I was encouraged by the group we got together the other day, Mr. Chairman, is that all of them have given me feedback. They want to be involved. They think it's important. Uh, they all have a role to play, whether it's providing services or identifying the businesses. Uh, you know, I think ICIC wants to come back to us with a proposal as to how they initiated getting a lot of the information out of the Detroit uh, casinos where they've initiated a project. So uh, not to necessarily say we don't need a, a person, but it'd still be interested in kind of flushing out relationships we can have that, with that group that was there the other day. Well, if there was somebody like the community colleges for this same role, I'd feel differently about it. Right. I mean, I think the community college is a big step. And, if, um, and, if, and probably wouldn't take a full-time person to track. Maybe one of us does it, or maybe somebody else does it. Um, so, but I didn't see anybody stepping up to do what we wanted, what we wanted done. Yeah. But if that changes, um, I, I, that, I, I followed up with Mary Kay from ICIC. They're they're definitely interested in giving us a proposal or even a, a, you know a, a project proposal related to that. A lot of that getting that initial information out of the operators as to what the outside spending categories are, what services do they necessarily contract out for. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, I think that alludes to the judge's point of that information may help us be able to evaluate license applications in terms of somebody's committing to small business, uh, supporting small business, we'll have an idea of where we will expect, you know, their uh, uh, the purchasing is going to go, and what you know, data can we gather that will validate what they're going to tell us in the license application? Uh, right, but that's only one side of the point. The other side right. is providing the suppliers that can do it. Right. So right. It's, it's both. And in, in, in some of the groups that we had at the table the other day are, are in that business capacity building space. Uh, MSBDC wasn't there, Small Business Development Center wasn't there, but. You had two lending institutions. You had some. You had some technical expertise that was there as well. Um, so I, I uh, I'd be anxious to see if ICIC comes back with something that we can kind of get our arms around and, and think that might be a good first step. Uh, but certainly, it's important. I think you know we ought to look to uh, what Pennsylvania does. They annually collect information on. Uh, 
who their business suppliers are, who their minority vendors are, minority employees. They track all that data. It's part of their annual report. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So we'll we'll see how we go with Pennsylvania. I'll, I'll maybe try to draft something up. But I just think as a matter of, you know, when you set priorities, you you got to have somebody whose job is is who's accountable, who's, you know, who's got a metric, who's got a performance standard, and if you don't, they slide. And these are the kinds of things that you, you get happy talk and not action. And I just don't want us to do that. So however, yeah, whatever we have to do to, okay. Um, employee manual, chapter two. Well. This is, um, in, in, in your packets, is a revised version um, of Chapter 2, which I believe um, is um, a chapter that we should consider um, adopting uh, uh, soon. Um, I can walk through any one of the <coughs> sections or take any comments. Um, Commissioner McHugh already uh, gave me a number of comments in the course of this last week, and those are reflected um, here. Comments, questions? I think this is uh, ready to go, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've, we've uh, been working on this uh, now. Commissioner Zuniga has, uh, for some period of time, it's it's uh, lengthy, it's extensive, but now it's in a number of ways been boiled down. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, concise, notwithstanding its comprehensiveness. And uh, it, it, we are beginning to hire people. We need to have a policy like this in place. And <clears throat> if uh, it isn't perfect uh, and nothing is, uh, we can always change it as we go along and encounter issues that, uh, that we need to address and change. So this is, a, I think, a very thoughtful, thorough, and comprehensive uh, document as it stands. And I would recommend our approval of it today and put it into place when we have it. I would agree that it's important to have it in place. Um, and as Commissioner Zuniga just pointed out, it is a it's a document that will change, um, and, it, and as as it should be. So uh, I want to commend Commissioner Zuniga for putting a lot of time and effort into this. And it's very well written, easy to understand, um, but yet lays out exactly what the expectations are. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Do you think? Oh, I think it would, I know Commissioner McHugh had questions about, I guess, safeguarding sensitive information and managing that. Do you feel comfortable with it? Uh, it's been, it uh, it's been uh, nicely revised to, to deal with those concerns. So, Mr. Chairman, I move that we well, adopt. Okay. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I move that we adopt uh, Section 2 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission Employee Handbook. Second? Second. Second. Um, I did have a couple of questions. I also agree it's a, it's a really good job and hateful project and great that you did it. <laughs> um, I wonder about genes. Um, we're, I know we agree and I agree that we don't want blue genes, but there are white genes and black genes and there are pretty dressy genes, which I would sometimes wear. And um, I wonder whether we really mean no genes, but this says no genes material. and. For my money, I'd rather say no blue jeans. Um, people refine. I can I can speak to that okay. uh, as to what you know why 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 it's, why it's there. Um, unfortunately, there are those uh, jeans, however color, that may be very tasteful, and those like that may not be, <laughs> and those that may not be, and um, the. The idea of including something like that is to err on the side of caution and, um, and, and issue a, a statement relative to we would like this, this look um, because it's very, it could be very <coughs> difficult, is my experience, to try to determine uh, what may be or may not be tasteful. Yeah. That's the genesis of yeah, of my, something like this that. is purely a matter of style and taste and management philosophy. You know, from my standpoint, I would rather, you know, like we do, like you're saying here, if your guests are coming, that even that, that creates a different standard, and leave it to our 
people to be responsible enough that they're going to dress right, and we don't. We talk to them. I hate micromanaging it, but mm. you know, like I said, it's a it's a matter of personal. I actually think we have guests every day to our office, and that will continue to be no, the case. Fine, yeah. And um, my experience with this is it's such a slippery slope. If you, I mean, professional attire is important, and uh, my experience with dress down Fridays was. Um, <laughs> was something that uh, people don't always get the message of what's appropriate. You're we had pajamas, we had, I mean, we just had all, all kinds of uh, uh, clothing that I just, I, 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 I don't think people always do get that message. So, Commissioner, I'm going to agree with you that uh, we need to be somewhat firm in our, in our policies, uh, especially we're new, uh, we want to set a tone. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's appropriate um, to, uh, to, to, to set a tone for no jeans in the workplace because I do believe every day we have, I don't think there's one day that goes by that we don't have guests to our office. Anybody else? I mean, it's, there's, we're two to one so far. Commissioner Stevens, you got a preference? I, I won't take it personally, <laughs> and I won't wear my jeans. <laughs> I was just happy to say, you know, you added with a belt because usually that's the last thing I forget to put on when I leave the house. <laughs> I leave an extra one in my Lots desk. Lots of young drawer. people forget that today too. Exactly. Um, I, you know, I, I think it just makes for a, uh, you know, a, a more even workplace if there's kind of left it, less discretion left up to an individual. I, I see I got to rule out cargo pants, so I'm all set. <laughs> so you don't have to decide. It's three to one, so you're off the hook. You don't have to make decisions. So. Well, I was just going to say, if we are going to, uh, if we have a threat of uh, pajamas in the police station, I, I don't want to oh. go that route. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, that, that was mm -hmm. one. Um, second one was uh, on page four. I just, I don't understand. It says no MGC employees shall illegally manufacture, distribute, dispense, um, but you can legally, apparently. So does that, I guess, does that mean you can bring wine, but you can't bring heroin? What does that mean? Um, well, maybe, um, well, there may be situations in which somebody, I mean, dispense is used in the statutes, um, is a very broad word, and it may be uh, permissible to dispense or distribute a controlled substance to a child, for example, a parent to, doing it to a child. It may be that, who knows, we get somebody with a, uh, with a pharmacist license and they're moonlighting on weekends. I mean, we've got a part-time policy. It's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a possibility. So it's, it's not necessarily redundant, but we, we could take it out. Yeah. Well, no, I just, I really didn't mean, but it, you, we could serve wine and beer if we wanted to Friday afternoon, right? That's not precluded because that's not illegal. Nope. No, it's not. It's not illegal. No. Yeah, right. And it's not precluded. Right? It's not precluded. You can't wear jeans when you have your wine and beer, but you can have your wine and beer. Okay. I can get half a loaf here. <laughs> I'm going to revisit this jeans for a while. <laughs> I'm trying not to, try not to bridle. The, the, on page 10, um, this is, I'm sure, just a matter of fact, but I didn't know this. Acting for others, former state employee, on top of page 10, it says a former state employee may not ever represent or receive compensation from anyone other than the state in connection to a particular matter. Is that, that is, in fact, the law. Right. Yep. Right. Wow. I had no I, idea. I, I have a good example on that, because uh, I, I, I think you raised that uh, before, um, <coughs> that I think, uh, you know, we should be able to relate. Let's assume that we, as a commission, awarded a conditional license to somebody. And one of us, after the fact, went in and worked for a law firm and started to want to come back to the gaming commission to, um, on behalf of that client, the conditional licensee, advocate to remove that condition. Uh, that would be a clear example where any one of us participation in that matter, it's the particular matter mm -hmm. that is very relevant and, and which will be precluded from ever uh, doing. 
Yeah, I didn't is, that, that. is that a good example in your opinion? Yes, it is a good example. And another example is the unseemly nature of uh, somebody who uh, works uh, for a private, having been an employee of the commission, uh, then goes to work for a private person, comes back to the commission and says as to some policy, well, I was part of the creation of that policy and we never meant it to apply the way you're <laughs> attempting to apply it now. That's hugely unseemly. And that's the kind of thing that this that's is. Meant to well, I, it's the word ever that surprised me. I right. mean, I, you know, and I'm, right. I wasn't even thinking so much as a commissioner. I mean, I'm thinking of when I was ANF secretary. What did I work on 10 years right. ago that I never even thought about before? So I just wasn't sure that was literally the case. But, but it's a specific matter. Yeah, it's I understand. Not, it's not the work in, in, in general. Yes, it's, I understand. It's the, right. right, I understand. And my last one is even more trivial than the, the others. Um, on page 16, the next to last paragraph um, where it, says, it starts out, while the commission does not, page 16. What version? We may have different paging. No, why would you? Do you have the 1120 version of this? Uh, no, I don't, sorry. Um, section 2.9, Supplemental Employment and Business Activities. Uh, prohibited. 2.9, 2. yeah. What page? 14? Page 14. 14. Yep. It says general statement and then it has general guidelines. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry if I'm working on an old one. Um, in that first paragraph under general guidelines, um, it's just a very long sentence. In, in the third line, it's my third line, it says activities of the employee's choice, a common comma would help <coughs> make that understandable. I told you it was more trivial than yep. mm -hmm. even the genes. I have those two. I mean, I thought it was really well written, the, the, the whole document, if misguided. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was it for me. I would have agreed with you before I had certain circumstances occur. <laughs> any, uh, any further discussion besides that last 15 minute waste of time? <laughs> Uh, all in favor of adopting uh, chapter two as amended with the comma. Aye. You say aye. 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 All opposed. <laughs> it is unanimous. Nice going, Commissioner Zuniga. Thank you to all of us. Excellent work. Thank you. Okay. Um, Director Durenberger. <laughs> and <laughs> friends. Good evening. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Oh, oh, oh. Introduce director yourself. Of, uh, yeah. Director of Racing, Jennifer Durenberger, and I have David Murray, who's a project consultant for Mr. us. Chairman. Um, briefly, since we last met, um, I've had some stakeholder meetings um, at Suffolk Downs and at Plain Ridge Racecourse. And I just want to let you know that, one, the difference in this meeting versus the meetings we had earlier was instead of meeting operations staff and racing staff, this was meeting with participants in racing, so owners, trainers, breeders, and racetrack management as well. And I'm really happy to report to you all that this is a great group. This is a great industry in this Commonwealth, and they are really a very dedicated bunch. And I think they're going to be a pleasure to work with. So great. more so than in other jurisdictions, or is that the run? That's the normal. I think mode? I think that's just racing people. Yeah, right. Okay. It's just you know, yeah. um, just people who are very dedicated and love what they do, and, and I'm finding that to be the case here as well. Uh, we do have uh, a date and time for our first working group meeting. Now, the working group is the group that's going to try and help implement any regulatory reform in an efficient and expeditious manner while being inclusive at the same time. Uh, that's going to be on November 19th. It'll be held at Suffolk Downs. The follow-up meeting will be on the 28th of November, and that's going to be at Plain Ridge. Uh, and let's see here, dovetailing with that, um, we've been working on the legislative review process, and that's why I brought David Murray along. We're sort of at this stage identifying big picture issues, which we just wanted to put before you, uh, not to deliberate about them or to, to spend any time in detail with them, but just to let you know some of the, the big issues that will be put before you to think about uh, in the near future. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, we're looking at at least the first part of this review. We're looking at uh, the 
our mutual and simulcast laws and how they fit in, how they can be harmonized with uh, the Gaming Act. And um, we have pretty much completed that particular portion of um, the assignment. And we will be shortly <coughs> finalizing the sense of the whole team sign off um, on that part so that we can uh, uh, submit it um, to the commission uh, for consideration and um, deliberation. Um, we obviously will be putting in recommendations um, and explaining those recommendations in terms of um, what the statute says, um, some uh, policy related to the realities of the environment in which uh, the statutes are operating. Um, and it's going pretty smoothly, I would say. Um, the challenges, such as they are, um, arise really out of circumstances in which the um, racing operation and the gaming operation, in effect, share space. And um, there are some definitions in the gaming statute that um, on a, on a surface reading of the language of the statute would suggest that all of the increased um, heightened um, um, scrutiny, for instance, as related to the licensing of employees of licensees would apply beyond the gaming operation to um, uh, potentially to um, uh, employees of the racing operation that were not involved. In, in, in gaming, but I think that we um, are coming to an understanding of the context of that language of the statute, and um, we will be putting together some recommendations as to the interpretation of these potentially challenging uh, uh, provisions. Of, of Can you give us an idea, of, like what an example of what yes. you're talking about? Um, the definition of gaming establishment, which is a phrase that is used throughout the Gaming Act, includes um, non-gaming premises that the statute says are, if they are, related to the gaming area. The statute does not say what related means, whether it's a geographic um, um, construct that the statute is trying to implement or whether it's an operational um, uh, concept that ought to be used to look at whether one thing is related to another. Um, but we feel that in the proper context, um, that is to be understood really to be um, a relationship that is actually both geographic and operational in the same way that now for racing, Certain employees, the people behind the wagering windows, for example, um, have a heightened um, uh, uh, security, a heightened threshold to surmount uh, for licensing purposes than those, for instance, who um, wait at tables in the restaurant or um, uh, are out in the back lot um, uh, dealing with the handling of horses. Um, and of course, in addition to that kind of um, um, analysis and, and um, preparation of recommendations to the commission, we, we have to look at the question of whether or not these things ought to be dealt with in regulations rather than statutes, or whether we really do have to um, go back to the legislature and say, you need to do this and that to, to, to solve these problems, and we're sensitive to the flexibility that um, regulations provide that would be absent if um, we needed to um, uh, go back to the legislature for statutory change. Of course, that is always um, a, a balancing exercise. Um, there's some risk that's always involved that someone later on will come and say, um, you didn't have the power to do this, and therefore it's invalid, um, and, and we're conscious of that those possibilities, that risk analysis. But we'll be making some recommendations to you in the, with that, in the background. Okay. 
Thank you. And what's the time frame here? Um, we're going to get the first bit, I think, um, through the approval by our team, um, certainly by the beginning of middle of next week. Uh, and at that point, um, we will start working on drafting up something related to um, improvements to the current um, um, uh, racing structure. Which doesn't involve conflicts with uh, the Gaming Act. It just simply is an operational matter. Here right. is how we would like to improve things, um, and that we will certainly get um, approval. I would think from the from the working group um, and to the commission by by Thanksgiving. I, I, I would hope, or probably the week after. Okay. Yeah. Is this the same working group as the your, that you set up? No. That, no. Oh, so, yeah, okay. th this is the director. Oh. Um, uh, Daniel Holmes right, okay. and, and, and I. Got it. All right. The internal. Yeah, got it. Okay. <laughs> got it. The so many division. groups. <laughs> so little time. Actually, yeah, the whole <laughs> racing division, frankly. <laughs> well, not. It, it's larger. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, Sounds great. Great. Thank you. David, thank you. Um, I had just a couple of personnel issues that I wanted to discuss. Yep. If you want to. However, whatever you'd like no, to do. I'll, I'll, I'll sit on the back. Okay. I have jeans on. <laughs> <laughs> you the man. Um, we are, the racing division is in the process of finalizing what we see as our piece uh, of the table of organization. Um, obviously, at some point, there's going to be some shared staff, but just in terms of key positions within racing to keep racing operational at this point. So we'll have that finalized, and I understand that that's going to need to come before you next week. So we'll put that on the agenda for next week uh, and discuss uh, the needs as we've assessed them and, and the plan and the, the vision that we have to fulfill those needs uh, and make sure that racing continues to operate in the Commonwealth. Um, the issue that I did want to discuss today, uh, and this was a procedural gaffe on my part for not getting this specifically on the agenda, uh, but regarding the state racing lab, uh, which is the laboratory that currently conducts the equine drug testing for racing in the Commonwealth. I think earlier this year, um, you had the consultant group that came in, Last Frontier, and made some recommendations. Uh, and among those recommendations was to put forth an RFP to secure some laboratory services from a laboratory that is accredited to these model rule standards that we were talking about, uh, Racing Commissioners International, is the regulatory body um, that Massachusetts is part of. And they have a model rule regarding laboratories that specifies uh, an accreditation standard. Uh, it sets requirements for instrumentation that the lab has and for testing capabilities. Uh, and so that RFP, uh, we're in the finalization, we're in the finalizing period for that. That would probably go out next week. Having said that, um, I think that I'm in agreement with the report that the consultant put out earlier this year that the current lab does not meet those specifications. And I think that if the commission wants to align itself with the model rules going forward uh, and participate in this push for national uniformity, then I guess I'm in full recommendation of, of that report that we do look to outsource the lab or to find another lab within Massachusetts that would meet those requirements. Um, I think participants in racing want uniformity of rules, particularly as it regards to medication. It's very difficult if you race in one jurisdiction and then you have to play by a different set of rules when you go to the next jurisdiction. Um, and that's particularly true in New England and the Mid-Atlantic, where there is quite a bit of, of movement. If you're in California, you're sort of on an island, and, and um, this doesn't come into play as much. But it's a specific issue in, in this part of the country. Um, and part of that uniformity is in your testing program. And your labs have to be playing by the same rules as well. And so this is a this finding a lab that can do the things that we need to be in conformity with these national medication rules and model rules is a big part of the regulatory picture. You said outsource or find another lab in Massachusetts. You mean outsource, right? It might be Massachusetts or some... Right. If we, yeah, if we put out an RFP, you know, we'll, we'll look to see who meets the vendor qualifications and we'll look at the different proposals and certainly if there is a lab within Massachusetts that, that can meet the vendor requirements right. and meet the specifications of the RFP. 
Yeah, my, my clear sense is so this was something that, that Annie Ullman suggested months ago. You were very much in favor of it. Yes. I've been assuming this would be happening all along. So Yes, but I, I'll let you continue. But, but you certainly will look to see wherever the labs are, whoever, as we do with all our <coughs> RFPs, um, we'll look to, to see what the proposals, and we'll make a decision based on uh, the best interest, um, the, the best proposal put forth. So... Um, yeah, I think we're all in agreement. We've had these discussions before you were on board, Director, and we're. Uh, I know that I'm in agreement, and I think the rest of the Commission is also as far as uh, going in this direction. It makes sense. Yeah. How do you, if, if they're not messed, I'm just fascinated, but maybe, maybe well, I, I better not ask that question. Uh, <laughs> I know what you're going to ask, and there's this it's amazing not Massachusetts. Me well, it's and shipments, it? and it's all done. Uh, with st sterile containers that are taped and sealed properly, it's it's a. I've learned an awful lot about right. this commissioner, and right. it's. Um, I think I know enough. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more to know, and I am happy to share it with you at any point. <laughs> are there are there um, some national labs that do testing for a variety of states? The, variety there are there are, and um, a lot of our national industry bodies um, have been pushing on this accreditation issue. Um, at, the, the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium is an industry group that has a lot of stakeholders, both thoroughbred and standard bred, which are the two breeds that race here. Um, they have been very uh, vocal about reaching these accreditation standards and working with labs to become accredited to a specific standard within the United States. And they're working toward that process. In the absence of that, the current recommendation, the best practice is to find a lab that is accredited to this international standard, 17025, if you're keeping notes. Um, and so that is the recommendation. And, and I believe there are four or five labs currently in the United States that do conform to that. And, and they are doing testing. A lot of these labs will test, they have contracts with three or four different jurisdictions. So it's SOP to move them back and forth across state lines? They use bonded courier, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, it's, yeah. and so they, they actually maintain the chain of custody in, in a way that's probably it's very uniform. <laughs> it, it, it's it's done yeah. with crime labs all the time yeah, too. Right. Evidence is sent. Right. Um, DNA is, is shipped. It's yeah. it's amazing the way security measures have right. uh, have uh, evolved, and um, it's not a hard thing to do today. So, is that uh, one seven zero two five requirement going to be part of the RFP? It's in the RFP. Yes. So, is it fair to say that? Uh, the five labs, the five national labs, maybe the wet, the best ones to um, position to answer. They may uh, be. To respond. We did we did write it that they would be accredited to that standard or in the process of because it's a very lengthy uh -huh. process. So I didn't want to disqualify if somebody was very close and you know perhaps even by the time the contract was initiated. I mean I didn't I didn't want to exclude anyone who was trying to achieve that standard. Mm -hmm. So that was how it was written. They're accredited, but not to that same standard as what Correct. you're saying. Correct. Right. And then if they are in the process of being accredited to that standard, Correct. they would have preference. Correct. Is there, is there any chance in the RFP process that, there's, say, there's nobody in Massachusetts with the capacity here, and you, you do find an out of state vendor, is, is there enough of, of business generated that it would make sense for somebody to site, expand their operations? And, and, actually it's, develop a facility in Massachusetts? I can't speak to the exact numbers, um, but I do know that there are a large number of commercial testing labs in the country, and very few have chosen to accredit to this standard, which would lead me to believe that the answer to your question uh, is probably that an, it's an expensive standard to meet. Okay. And so there may not be ultimately enough to, to keep, say, eight, nine, ten labs to that level in this country. Okay. but. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the numbers there. Do you want to? Uh, I think it's appropriate to to move on this. Do you want to have a motion to implement this? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I would make a motion that we at this time uh, approve the process of getting the RFP out, and that we uh, vote that uh, using an accredited lab is in the best interest of racing in the Commonwealth. Second. Any further discussion? Um, accredited lab, or at least, as you pointed out, a lab moving towards accreditation? Well, no. The, the, any lab that we would select would be an accredited lab. There's a higher level of accreditation okay. that only a couple of labs have, in the country have met. Okay. So I think what the director just pointed out, that she wouldn't want to 
uh, rule out a lab that may be on their way very close to that next level of accreditation. Okay. Right. And sorry. I'm sorry, I should have probably been clearer on that. There are, there are as, as Commissioner Cameron pointed out, a number of different levels of accreditation. And so this, this particular standard is right now the industry best practice. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. <coughs> so far you're one for one. The second piece of that, you have a secondary recommendation, which would be? Yeah, so then, so having, having voted on that, um, there is just the consideration. Um, the laboratory is currently leasing space from UMass Medical Center in Jamaica Plain. Um, that lease expires on December 31st as part of an ISA uh, with DPL. Our last racing samples would be arriving at that laboratory on November 29th, I believe. Um, and so that would mean testing through the first week of December. And then if there were not any positives or overages or suspicious samples in that last shipment, um, that would basically give us about two business weeks to clear out of that laboratory. And there's a number of considerations. Um, there's some hazardous materials. There's some chemicals. Um, it's not just cleaning out your desk with your banker's box and, and walking out the hall. So I've been in contact with uh, Aaron Levy. He's the business manager. He's the landlord over there. Um, and uh, he tells us that they do have an environmental health and safety officer that can assist us in that process. And obviously, I'm going to have to find out what additional paperwork is, is generated there. But um, we really have about two business weeks to, to inventory and either dispose or rehome of, of the equipment that we have there right now. Is that enough time, Director, to complete the process? I would have a comfortable answer for you next week. Okay. By the end of this week. Okay. Um, did you speak to the, uh, uh, what, what was his title? He is the uh, business, business manager. manager. Is it, would, the, would there be any flexibility in another week or two that we could compensate them for if we needed that? My, my feeling was that he was very flexible. The, the issue we're going to run into and, and that we'll all have to think about is that <laughs> this lease is part of the ISA. And so asking for an extension now, we get into the, do we, do, is that, is our contract with them then going to be, have to be rewritten for Massachusetts Gaming, or do we reimburse DPL for an extension, or what, or is the ISA extended? And those well, we are wouldn't be doing any more testing in the lab. Correct. It's just a question it's of cleaning the, the lab out, yeah. so I'm not mm -hmm. sure that would be necessary, but we could do some checking. Yeah. So, so it's, I, I think what you're saying is we're not, we're not ready to vote on an official closing of, uh, of the lab until you right. have some more information. I think we have a few more questions we need to okay. answer. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. What potentially do you do with all the equipment? Um, some of it, um, I, I don't understand all of the disposal um, procedures for the Commonwealth, but there are some things that may, may be able to be rehomed. Uh, uh, quite a bit of the equipment over there it has either been shut down because there hasn't been anyone trained to operate it um, or has not been updated in a while. So I would imagine that whichever office we work with in the Commonwealth will I don't know if it goes out to bid or, or if it can be parted out. Uh, there is still an existing service contract, so some of those machines are still uh, being serviced by the manufacturer. But so we can check on that also. Mm -hmm. We're in the process of doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank Anything you for your update. Anything Thank else? You. I think that's plenty. Uh, plenty. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Item six, public education and information. Um, report from the Ombudsman. We've previewed some of your stuff, but you probably have some more on your first week of work. Grab that. So, uh, as you mentioned, grab that mic. Great. Yep. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I already uh, mentioned some of my activities from this past week, but uh, to sum up, uh, I've either spoken to or met with all of the identified potential host communities so far. Um, I've spoken to some of the key state agencies. I have a meeting this week with uh, the point person for EOT. I've been in contact with Maeve on some of the environmental matters. I've reached out to the regional planning agencies for each of the uh, affected areas. Um, and then I've met or spoke with representatives from, um, from most of the identified potential applicants. Um, also was a participant in the uh, proceedings over the last day, or day and a half with, with our consultant. Uh, general, generally what I have to report to you is that uh, people are very welcoming of the outreach that we are uh, putting out to them um, and they look forward to the 
uh, to the dialogue regarding whatever interests they have or questions they have and whatever further information that we can provide them. Um, the focus of the, my conversations to date have been to try to scope out how we will all work together, um, what needs to go into uh, them keeping me up to date with their local processes, uh, how can I best help them, um, and the like. In, in the context, my conversations over the next week or so will be uh, very similar. Uh, after these initial meetings with you know some of the key representatives from each of the host municipalities, uh, I'll, I'll try to reach further within into those municipalities uh, to the degree that that uh, makes sense. And then uh, at some point in the near future, in the next days, in the next couple of weeks, then we also need to start identifying and working with uh, some of the uh, some of the surrounding communities as well, especially to the extent that they have already made themselves known to the commission and have asked for assistance. Um, well, I've also been trying to work on a couple of matters that have been identified to me in the context of those conversations. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, with the different host communities of different sizes, uh, different issues will come into play. Uh, Boston is not similar in its structure, uh, government structure, to uh, you know, a Palmer or a Raynham or a Taunton. Um, and for example, I'm wor working with Commissioner Zuniga regarding an issue of municipal finance. We have a, a meeting scheduled uh, up next week with the uh, Department of Revenue Division of Local Services to explore uh, what are some of the municipal finance limitations regarding the, the funding of consultants, uh, either funding through us or funding through uh, directly through the uh, private vendors working with the municipalities. And uh, there are different issues for um, for smaller municipalities who work through town meeting and with uh, obviously with larger cities that uh, can put an appropriation on uh, rather readily. Uh, we're working on some of those issues. But uh, uh, we've also been working with Director Durenberger regarding uh, some of the uh, racing funding issues and the transition to gaming. But I'll leave that to a future, uh, future item because I know that that's well in process and there's been meetings uh, to this date. But, uh, some of the other key points that I was going to mention, uh, the focus on these questions, these policy questions, I think that that is very welcome out there. Uh, it's, a, it's a real good opportunity uh, for people to weigh in at this point, and uh, I think that the process that you've established for uh, soliciting comments will be uh, workable, with the, at least with the communities that I've spoken, spoken to. Uh, I think that the setting of a deadline really works for them so that everybody is working on an equal playing field. and. Uh, comments and questions will be received all at the same time so that uh, um, uh, so that they'll be received in that, in that light. But uh, generally that's what I have to report. Sounds great. In, any um, developments on the Gaming Policy Committee? Uh, I had been in touch with the Governor's Office um, you know, prior to my arrival here. Um, I've reached out to them again and I've been looking over the, the statute um, as well, uh, I've had initial contacts with you know some of the legislative leaders. I haven't uh, really broached the, the the contacts to the advisory commission, but um, that's something I plan on doing. Okay, um, Commissioner Cameron and I mentioned it with to Speaker DeLeo, and uh, there's a person on his staff that was going to be well, probably Jim Kennedy, mm -hmm. um, but that's some place you could follow up. Great, and they were they were going to get moving on. Oh, um, there was a question about Springfield and, and Chapter 30B. Has that been resolved one way or the other? I, I have not um, been able to speak with um, Barbara Hansbury on this, on this matter. I've left her a message okay. since we last spoke. We're, we're not invested one way or the other. We just need to make sure that, that we know what the rule is and that it's being complied with, and it apparently is, but we just want to make sure. Okay. Right, and I, I should have mentioned that uh, Springfield uh, made their RFP available to us. They released an RFP this past Thursday. Uh, they also established their own commission. Uh, over the next few days, we'll learn a little bit more about their timelines and about their processes. Uh, what we spoke to them about was that uh, you know we are concerned, or, or not concerned is the wrong word. Um, what our goal, our goals here, are to just make sure that everybody uh, understands uh, what what is required of all of these different processes, including procurement, to the extent that that may or may not apply. Right. Okay. Good. Sounds great. Anything Thank else? You. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um,
requests from regional groups. I'm not sure what that is. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> okay, that was a senior moment. Um, item seven, the research agenda. Um, we have drafted the guts of an RFP. I've, I've sent it out to not you know, the, the RFP is a lot of boilerplate. We haven't done that part yet, although it's being worked on. Um, but um, we've had drafted uh, the sort of scope of work, and uh, Commissioner Zuniga is making some comments on it. It's been sent out to our informal advisory group, and we'll get comments back. We're going to try like the Dickens to get it out this week, um, mm -hmm. but worst case, we'll get it out first to next week. Right. Yeah. Right. Internet gaming. Um, there is still the lingering question of this Reed Kyle legislation, um, and the the treasurer had originally asked that we take a position in support of his position, which is that um, we aren't in favor of the legislation as it stands. We weren't really familiar with it last week. We didn't really understand exactly um, what was in it. There were some racing issues we needed to double check. The racing issues are not a problem. Um, but we're still not quite clear whether we want to do anything on Reed Kyle or not as it stands. Um, I, I have not read the whole law, and I, even if I did, I'm not sure I'd know what it was saying. Um, but we have, does anybody else have other feedback or thoughts? Commissioner McHugh, you've got. Well, I haven't read the entire uh, statute either, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there were a, a couple of thoughts that I had based on the parts that I did read. Um, uh, number one, um, the statute uh, does uh, give a preference initially uh, to gaming regulators who have been up running and operational for some period of time. But it does not limit uh, the gaming regulators <clears throat> to uh, Nevada. It, prescribes a three initial gaming regulators um, and uh, for um, for uh, approval as internet gaming regulators and and uh, creates a an umbrella federal agency that will uh, uh, decide who those initial regulators are and they can be state regulators or tribal regulators so it does spread that around and and uh, it seems to me that, for example, Atlantic City may fit in that role. Uh, uh, Nevada certainly it does, but it does not strike me that it gives Nevada an exclusive. In fact, with three state gaming regulators, Nevada won't be alone. Um, it uh, sets up an umbrella organization, a federal umbrella organization. It seems to me that, as we talked about a little bit last time, with a national organization, with a national uh, state, basically state regulated system, one has to have an arbiter uh, at the federal level to to uh, control things. Otherwise, it simply becomes a uh, competitive uh, exercise uh, between and among the various states. And so, the logic of having a federal regulator superimposed over state regulators, uh, uh, like many other models, uh, Medicaid, for example. Uh, is a sound one, it seems to me. Uh, thirdly, um, it uh, the statute does give a preference to large uh, brick and mortar uh, entities, whether they be casinos, uh, racetracks, uh, or other uh, large gaming facilities, um, and says that they initially, again, I think it's for a two-year period, will be the uh, only uh, entities that qualify for uh, an internet gaming license. It seems to me, although I don't, I haven't read this clearly enough and haven't looked at, at all of the preamble, uh, but it seems to me this is an effort at the federal level to preserve the brick and mortar uh, casino institutions from um, uh, the kind of competition uh, that could eradicate the uh, huge investments that uh, many of them have made, uh, while at least uh, the internet allowing the internet poker to, to uh, proceed and, and make some judgments about the likely impact on the, the substantial investments that have been made. And, and uh, it seems to me um, that's not an unreasonable way of approaching this, at least at the outset. And finally, it does, um, the legislation does uh, prohibit 
um, internet uh, uh, lottery, <coughs> uh, uh, in internet uh, scratch tickets, and internet uh, keynote. Um, uh, I think that one, I just don't have a position. I don't know whether that's good or bad. Um, uh, but at least nobody gets a competitive advantage because the ban is universal. Nobody can do it. Uh, and so uh, Massachusetts would not be at a disadvantage um, um, uh, competitively with other states if that portion, portion of the legislation passed. Um, so I, I, I don't see a great deal there based on uh, my understanding thus far to be exercised about. Um, and I would be, I would welcome an opportunity to talk further with, with others more knowledgeable uh, about this uh, collectively uh, to see if my uh, initial approach is right. But at the moment, I just don't see a great deal to be exercised about. But why the, uh, I think what many are unhappy with is this, these three states. Some were interpreting it as Nevada only, but you're, you're mentioning three states why they got the competitive advantage over all the others who have had gaming and are planning to have a gaming. Well, the, the legislation doesn't mention which three states they, which three mm -hmm. jurisdictions they are. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, federal agency will have the responsibility for naming them, choosing them from among everybody who believes that they can qualify uh, to long be long time gaming establishment. Yes, yes. They have to yes. they so, have to be long time so gaming establishment. Which does lend to Nevada, New Jersey. Um, so I think many are interpreting that to mean a preference to those and that's what right. the objections they're coming from uh, is yeah. my understanding. As as gaming regulators. Yes. Uh, not yes. as gaming uh, not as gaming participants, as gaming regulators. And that, uh, too, is for a short time while this is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, worked in. In fact, I think the legislation provides that no license for anybody can be issued for the first 18 months after the legislation is passed so that the federal agency has enough time to set itself up and, and explore these things. Now, that may be ultimately a legitimate uh, uh, a legitimate objection to this. Why should it just be those three as yes, opposed to opening it up? Mm -hmm. But at the moment, transitionally, it does that affect to, us? Is your point? You don't see it. I don't see it adversely, us. right? Because by the time we're ready, mm -hmm. um, that two-year period will be gone. So, well, what I uh, what I understood from what, once you overlay the um, potential preference to the regulating um, entity, perhaps favoring a, a state like Nevada with um, the other preference to the land-based um, operations. <coughs> uh, when, when, you, when you put those together, you could make an assumption that uh, only those um, operations with licenses in Nevada will be in a good position, uh, mm -hmm. in a first mover advantage, which in the internet world, I'll be two years, could be significant. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 problem for, for the commission, if you will, as I see it, is that the landscape of those bidding out for licenses in Massachusetts includes people who are uh, operators who are licensed in Nevada and operators that are not, uh, which could present uh, a, a question for this commission to consider. It's my opinion that uh, that uncertainty could mean uh, different things for different operators here. And that is, I think, the, the, the genesis of uh, why we need to think about uh, this issue. Yeah. yeah, I don't disagree we should think about the issue. I just don't understand how we are put in Massachusetts at the, at, during, the, during this initial period at a disadvantage. I, I, just, I just don't understand. Yeah. And and it obviously is designed to, it seems to me, to protect these the big investments that these people made in, in uh, hardware and bricks and buildings. There's there's a pragmatic side to these which I can uh, I think I, I <coughs> we articulated a little bit last time. Um, it's unclear what um, this bill go where this bill goes. Uh, there does not seem to be a. Um, 
a virgin in the House. Uh, they, they, who knows what will happen with the next U.S. Congress and, and, and so on. But um, um, if nothing else, as, as these issues start to come up, uh, I think it's important for us to uh, consider the implications that they may have on our nascent industry. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, you know, now that I think about it, I wish we'd ask our gaming mm -hmm. consultants when they were here what, you know, what they think. Right. And I think I, that's something I will take the responsibility for doing. And um, I might also ask uh, one of the lawyers in the, gov in the treasurer's office if they've got a better handle on, you know, why they were so, uh, why they were so concerned about it. I know of one little one that may be relevant. Uh, there's there's a traveling kino uh, game uh, that where that they feel will be impacted directly yeah. by, by something like this. Well, their con their concerns about the lottery yep. impacts. You know, yep. I have an inclination to say they're a brother agency. They know what they're doing, presumably. I'd be supportive of them if they think it's going to hurt them relative to the lottery. That's a position that I would tend to defer to their judgment and tend to want to be supportive. Going further to the other issues that really have more to do maybe with the game, with our side at the table, the gaming table, um, I, with Commissioner McHugh, that I really don't know enough about it to feel like I have a very strong opinion. Um, but I think if we'll, we'll, let's check in, let's try to get a little more information here. Um, there's also somebody on Barney Frank's staff, who I'm told is very knowledgeable about the internet poker stuff, who might be able to give us a little more of a, you know, a Massachusetts view on how this legislation cuts. Um, and you know, I certainly feel like we have later on this month we have the next meeting, and then the follow will be the final meeting of the Treasurer's Task Force on Online Gaming, which hopefully will be laying out a uh, a set of recommendations about where Massachusetts ought to be going or at least has options where to go, which will probably inform this. So uh, that'll, I think that will help us a lot when, when we get that report. Right. Right. Oh, okay, so I think there's nothing more to do on that one at this point. Um, any other business that wasn't anticipated? Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.